hear now the reading of God's Word from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 27. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we're all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, now you, you are, are the body, body of, of Christ, Christ and, and each one, one of you is a part of it. of it. And may God bless the reading of his word to our hearts and lives today. Dean, thank you so much for participating in that. We wanted this to be a visual reminder of the things that we were going to be talking about together today. Uh, a visual and an auditory reminder of the fact that God has taken all of the different parts and each one of you represents a different part. And as we're in this series called Interwoven, he has interwoven it all into this body that we call the body of Christ. Now, to help get us thinking about this a little bit, I want to share with you an example. Now, if you read my weekly newsletter, you probably got a little introduction into this. By the way, if you're not getting the weekly newsletter and you'd like to know what's happening here, let the church office know. Let's put you on an email list so you can see some of the different things that we're learning together and you get a preview of what's happening in the life of the church. One of the things that I've shared with you is that on no less than three separate occasions, I have broken my pinky toe. Now, on one occasion, we happened to be running through the house, and as I was running through the house, I caught the edge of my foot on the couch and on one of the legs underneath the couch, and immediately I knew I had done something bad. Uh, Another occasion, we were actually down at uh, Nicole's Oma and Opa's condo. Uh, they had since passed, her parents had had this condo, and the family was in the process of selling it. We were down in Florida visiting. We were going to be going to Disney World. And uh, in order to get the house ready to go, this condo to go, uh, they actually replaced the windows. Well, when we walked in, there was dirt that had been tracked all throughout the house. And we were just astounded that whoever had fixed it up had left it that way. So we said, well, they can't sell the house this way. We've got to fix it. And so here we go. We start cleaning the house and we start vacuuming. Well, for whatever reason, there's no furniture in this house, but I happen to stub my toe on this stupid vacuum, and instantly, I heard a snap, like the snap of a twig, right? And I'm dragging my foot across the floor, you know, because my foot hurts so bad. Here's what's amazing, right? Who knew that something so tiny could cause so much pain, 
You know, and then I had to walk around Disney World for the next week like this. <laughs> and for those first couple of days, that hurt. And so you think to yourself, how could some, one of those little phalanges, right? Man, they cause so much pain, even though they are so small. And I would say to myself, every time I've done this, you know, why don't I just cut off my toe? Like, wouldn't it just be so much easier not to have to deal with it at all? And then you learn that something so small actually has a function. Like your toes help you to balance. And so things like this that, you know, you think, well, you know what, this is indispensable. We, we could just, or this is dispensable. We could just simply get rid of it. What we actually find is even things like pinky toes have a part of the body. It's no wonder. Scripture says our bodies make us groan and sigh. A lot of times we may experience that, the groaning and the sighing of our bodies. And oftentimes when we think about our bodies, we don't think complimentary thoughts about them, right? We think that they're too fat or they're too skinny, they're too lumpy, they're too plumpy. You know, you're too tall, you're too short. A lot of times we experience pain in the body. Some of us have chronic pain that we experience in the body. And so it may be strange for us to actually hear Paul say that we are a part of the body of Christ. Because who wants to be a part of a broken down body? It's also strange to think about the fact that we refer to our bodies and we refer to the church sometimes as if there are parts of us that don't really fit in or that don't really belong. Sometimes you hear us say things like you belong here or that you matter to God and that you matter to us. But the reality is sometimes we look at our lives and we don't necessarily feel like we belong. We don't feel like we matter. Sometimes you may feel like one of these puzzle pieces where we say every piece matters and yet you look at your life and you would say, I don't really feel like it makes a difference. I don't really feel like it fits so often in our family, we've gotten into doing about 2,000 piece puzzles, and I, it feels like almost every time we get to the end and there is always a piece missing. And it is so frustrating because we wonder, like, did we walk off with it? Did it stick to an arm? Is it somewhere? And, and you just feels like we're always missing a piece. And maybe for you, you feel like, you know, there's just a piece that's missing, or I don't really feel like I belong. But if you've ever put together a puzzle and you know that there's a missing piece, you get frustrated by it because you're like, no, it's not complete without it. And the truth is, the body isn't complete without each and every one of you. You know, one of the things that I truly believe in our culture is that people do long to connect. They want to be a part of something. This is why people join fraternities, and they join sororities, and they join optimist clubs, and they join churches, and biking clubs, and running clubs, and all these different things. People want to belong, right? For many of you, if you grew up and you remember watching a TV show like Cheers, right? What was the theme song, right? Sometimes you got to go where everybody knows your name right? And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. And I think for us so often, maybe we feel like we don't belong. Maybe we feel like we don't fit. But for us to be able to say together today, every person matters and every person belongs. This is the way the church should be. We've been in this series called Interwoven, how, how we're saying all of these different pieces are being interwoven together into the body of Christ. And so we've talked about how God weaves together men and women, how God weaves together young and old, how God weaves together black and white, and all of these, and rich and poor, all of these things are being woven together into this beautiful body of Christ. And what I hope we discover together today is this body is not complete without you. This is why I think it's actually pretty cool that we're talking about this on Pentecost Sunday. Because I want us to think back throughout the church. 
and throughout history. And if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, after the days of Noah, it says that all the people are speaking one language. And they're going to build this incredible tower, this Babel. And, and what happens is this tower that's going to be built to their own power and majesty and glory. But what happens, God comes down and he says he confuses their language. And as a result, all the people are spread all throughout the world. And so here you have all of these different people all around the world. They're all speaking different languages. But on Pentecost Sunday, all of these people are gathered together in one place. And what happens, tongues of fire descend upon the believers and everyone starts speaking in different languages and people can understand each other in these different languages. God has taken what has been separated and what we see is how at Pentecost God is bringing all of these things together. And we really see how the church is being born. And because of this, what we see is that every person matters. One body with many different parts. None of us can say, I don't matter and I don't belong. And none of us can say, you don't matter and you don't belong. Instead, what we see is everyone comes together. Every piece of the puzzle is important. Now, if you want to follow along and take notes this morning, there's a couple of things that I want to draw your attention to as we kind of begin to unpack this passage together. And the first thing is this. I want you to see the importance of being united. All right, the importance of being united. Listen to what Paul says again in verses 12 to 13. Just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews and Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given one spirit to drink. If you think about it, there's really nothing more united than a body. I mean, think about it. You and I don't think of it in terms of all of its separate parts. When I woke up this morning, I did not say, Aaron, don't forget to take your arm to church this morning. You know, like we, we just don't think that way because it's a part of who we are. I know, I'd hate to lose an arm. We hate to lose a part of the body. We try to protect the parts of our bodies at all costs. In the same way, we should be thinking about all of us being a part of this one body, not individual parts. So how are we all united? Why are we all united? Notice, first of all, we are united by our spiritual baptism. Paul says we are baptized into one spirit. Now, we often think of baptism as a time when somebody gets wet, right? But I want you to know, when you look at all the different times that the word baptism is used in Scripture, there's actually only a handful of times when you actually see someone getting wet. In every other case, this word baptism is used to say, you have been given a new identification. You have been given a new personhood. When you are baptized, you are actually baptized and identified with something. Listen to what Paul says. We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were given a place by the Holy Spirit. You were identified with Him. You have a new identity. Listen to this. Because... Jesus Christ is the son and child of God. You too are a son or daughter of God. Because Jesus has eternal life, you will have eternal life. Because Jesus has, is righteous, you too will be declared righteous. Because he was crucified, you are crucified with him. Because he rose from the dead, you also will rise from the dead. Because he is an heir to the kingdom, you too are a co-heir with Christ, receiving all of the things that have been given to Christ. So what that means is, because of 
Christ's death and resurrection, because we were baptized into this spirit, into this body, you have all of the things that comes to Christ because we are a part of his body. Notice, by the way, that this body also goes beyond all boundaries. Paul says, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Remember the context of the day. Jews and Gentiles hated one another. If they were at a meal, they would sit apart from each other. If a Jew was walking down the same straight side of the street as a Gentile, they would cross over to the other side of the street so they wouldn't even have to be on the same side. Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan for a reason, because of the way in which people hated one another. But notice, Paul says, we are now one in Christ Jesus. Of course, another barrier that Paul mentions is the difference between those who are slaves and those who are free. The barrier that existed that one group would be considered property to be owned by someone else. Another group would be considered free and would be able to do whatever they want. But what Paul says is that this boundary that has separated them has now brought them together. The boundary has fallen. We are made one in Christ. In fact, one of the things you could see, easily say is that this entire interwoven series is really summed up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There is no such thing as one church for the Jews and one church for the Gentiles. There's no such thing as one church for men and one church for women. There's no such thing as a church for upper class or middle class or lower class. There's no such thing as a church for black people or white people. There is one church church and it is the church of jesus christ and i believe it grieves the heart of god when we see a church being segregated from one another in fact i always say this a church should reflect the community in which it is in and what that means is we need to look within our own hearts and say how does wepc reflect the community of warsaw are there people who aren't here who should be here? And what we need to say is, if that's the case, and I believe that it is, then we need to be thinking about ways where we can continue to reflect our community so that we can see every tribe, creed, language, tongue, everyone gathered together in the body of Christ. The church is to be the place of equality amongst men and women, amongst those that we're trying to reach. Second, notice this. Paul reminds us of the importance of being different. The importance of being different. And we've already been talking a lot about this, right? Um, but, you know, oftentimes in our culture, we want to be the same. Uh, it's why you see the same hairstyles, the same dress, right? How many of you, I, certainly never me, but how many of you have ever taken a picture of somebody to a hairstylist and said, make me look like this, right? You know, I mean, we, we want to be the, the same. We talk about people like, oh, they're different, right? Because, well, they don't look the same. They don't talk the same. They don't act the same, right? But, but Paul says actually this, this difference is something that's to be celebrated. We are different and distinct from one another. Just as your body is made up of many different parts, so the body of Christ is supposed to be made up of many different members. Look at what Paul says in verse 14 and then 18 and 19. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. I just think it's, it just makes it sound so cool. It says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. You know what it's like when somebody tries to have you fit into their mold, right? You've got to look apart. You've got to dress apart. You've got to act apart, right? And we know what that's like. And if you don't, sometimes it feels like something is wrong with you. 
you know, I can remember when my mom first went back into teaching after she had us as kids. She started working at a full gospel school. Uh, it was hosted by this church. And for a little while, everything was fine. And then after a little while, they began to question her faith because my mom didn't speak in tongues. And so after a little while, she kind of navigated her way through that. But it really started to become apparent that they began to question her faith and they began to doubt her salvation. And so my mom prayed for months and months that God would give her the gift of tongues. And it never happened. But for her, she finally came to say, you know what? Then it's just not my gift. If it's not the gift that God is giving to me, but for the school where she worked, it really became almost a salvation issue. And so finally, she said, I need to step aside here. But I want us to see what, what is Paul saying to the Corinthian church? Some people have certain gifts. Some people don't have other gifts. You don't all have to have the same gifts. And what was happening in the Corinthian church is people were saying, hey, you don't seem to have this gift, and so you don't belong. And so there were arguments that were rising up in the life of the church. And Paul is trying to say, look, to think that you all have to have the same gift in order to belong to the body is actually a lie. There are different gifts, but there is one body. Since we're in the midst of the MLB season right now, I mean, think about it this way, right? Imagine if the center fielder said, I don't want to play center field today. I want to play first base. And if I don't get to play first base, then I'm not really a part of this team, right? Imagine if the pitcher said, I don't feel like pitching today. That's really not what I want to do. I want to catch. And the catcher, I want you to pitch. And so if I don't get to do these things, then I'm not really a part of the body, right? A baseball team would never function that way because you have a specific role to play. You have a specific job to play, but you're all one team. And what Paul is saying is, look, you all have different parts. You all have different roles to play, but you are all a part of the same team. I mean, think about it. None of you would probably say, I'm going to sell my arm for a million dollars right? Or I'd give up my eyes for like $50,000, or I might give up my kidney, you know, for $20,000. Like, we don't think of it that way, because we're like, each part of the body is indispensable. Like, I need this as a part of me. It's the same thing when it comes to the life of the church. God, listen to this, did not create a crippled church. And what that means is every person matters, and every role that you play, though it may have a different function, matters. It's not good to have one focus in the life of the church to the detriment of all the others. I really believe that as we have been interwoven together into this body, into this church, you, in all your various gifts and who you are, you make the body of Christ better and you make it richer by the way as i'm looking at this passage let me just give you another little side note when i look at this christianity is not a spectator sport right i mean we think about it you can't just sit on the sidelines and watch it from a distance you can't just come to church and say well what's in it for me like, what do I get out of this when I come here? Notice what Paul is saying is you have a job and a role to play. We don't come to church and just say, okay, this is what it's all about. It's really about service. How are we serving one another? How can I give to make the body of Christ stronger and better? We're to use our gifts to build up the body. And I think that leads to this last point if you're following along. It's the importance of being interdependent. It's the importance of being interdependent. I, I think it's important because we live in an age, right, where everything is about being independent, right? Look at what I did. I, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I, you know, I, I'm a self-made man or a self-made woman. And you, you think about all the stories that we lift up in our culture that are all about this independence in order to get things done. But the problem with that is that Christianity is not a religion of 
independence. It's actually a faith of interdependence. Yes, you make a personal decision to follow after Jesus Christ, but once you do, you are not saved to individuality. You are actually saved to be a part of something. You are saved out of sin into Christ, and Christ says, I want you to be a part of the body. What that means is that we were created to be interdependent upon each other. Again, listen to what Paul says in verses 22 to 26. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. What Paul makes clear is that independence is not a part of God's plan. God doesn't say, oh, you don't want to be a part of the church? Well, that's fine. You want to do your own thing? Well, that's fine. You want to do it yourself plan where you can just follow after God just by yourself? He says, no. You are to love the church. You are to love Christ, love the church. You are to be a part of the body. I can't do this without you, and you can't do this without me. We need each other. Even those parts that may seem weaker, Paul says, are actually necessary. You know, you think about it this way. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, what you see is your face. You don't often think, you don't look in the mirror and you think of your knees, right? Or you don't look in the mirror and you think of your feet. Um, you know, you don't look in the mirror and you think of like your appendix or your gallbladder, unless those things are bothering you, right? Then maybe you look in the mirror and you think of your feet or your knees or your appendix and things like that. But notice, it's the things that are often the least seen that are actually the most important, Right? You can't see your heart, but if your heart stops functioning, you're in big trouble. And what Paul is saying is, look, those things that may seem unnoticeable, that may seem unnecessary, are actually the most important parts. There are no unimportant parts of the body. In fact, Paul says it in such a way that he says, look, the connection that we have with each other is supposed to be so deep that if one person is hurting, everybody's hurting. If one person is experiencing joy, everybody gets to experience joy. I've heard it said this way, that pain shared is pain divided, but joy shared is joy multiplied. See, when you share pain with somebody else, we get to take a part of that pain from you, and we get to walk with you and help you. When you share joy, we all get to share in that joy together. And that's what Paul is saying. This is what the church is supposed to be. It's not interdependent. In fact, we're dependent upon one another. It's the unity and the diversity that makes the church beautiful. And that's what we're supposed to be, to be connected to one another. You know, I want to close with this. I, I came across, it popped up in my news feed this week, and I happen to be reminded of the story. Uh, it's from actually July 24th of 2002. Some of you may remember this story when there were a bunch of miners that were trapped in uh, western Pennsylvania, 240 feet below the ground. And everybody, this actually made the news for like three days in a row. I can remember this. And uh, I mean, it just was, it just kind of captured the news cycle for a while. And they thought that the people that were trapped in the mine were goners, that they just, it was, it was deep and it was dark and it was flooding. So there was water that was rising all around these guys, uh, 55 degree water. And so hypothermia was setting in. And when they finally did rescue them, they were saying, how in the world did you survive? And they said, we tied ourselves together. 
And they said when lunch would come, uh, uh, there would be a pail that would float by and we would each eat out of it. They said when one person was cold, we would all huddle around that person and we would keep them warm. We tied ourselves together so that if somebody died, we would all be found together. Like there was no one person that was going to be allowed to go off by themselves. And that's how they were able to survive. They did all of these things together. If one person was getting cold and passing out, they, they would hold them up above the water so that they were able to survive. Beloved people, that is exactly the picture of the church. We are to huddle together. We are being tied to one another. Why? So that we can build each other up, so that we can survive, and so that we can thrive, and so that we can provide life to others. And beloved people, that is exactly what we see as we come to the table of the Lord together today. I mean, when you and I gather at the table, what we are reminded of is the fact that we were saved into the body of Christ, that we were saved into Jesus Christ, who is our head. You and I cannot do this alone. We are tied not only to one another, but we are actually tied to Jesus Christ. We can't say, well, I'm going off and I'm going to do my own thing, Jesus. I'm the feet, so I'm going to go this way. I'm the hands, so I'm going to go and serve in this way. No, what we say is we need each other. And in all things, what we're praying is that we're saying, God, I want to follow after Christ because Christ, you are my head. Beloved people, what I pray we discover as we come to the table together today is that we are united. We are united with one another, and we are united with Jesus Christ. See, this feast, even though it's just a small piece of bread and a small cup, is, is a feast, and we say it's a feast of remembrance and of communion and of hope. See, we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. He gave his life on our behalf. He defeated death and he rose again. We remember all of these things. But we also come to have communion with this same Christ who has promised to be with us always. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto life eternal. And in the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. And here's the great news is when we commune with Christ, we are also communing with one another, with Christians all around the world today. We are but a small piece of the pie to think that there are people all around the world today who are communing with christ communing around this table and you and i are a part of that we're also a part of the saints who have gone before and so we are communing even with them today this church universal that we lift up and celebrate and this is also a feast of hope because we believe that one day with unveiled face we shall behold him and we shall be made like him in his glory. And so friends, as you and I come to this table today, we want you to know that you are loved. Jesus loves you. And he loves you so much that he would give of his own life so that we could experience life. He loves you so much that he has called you to be a part of his body, to be a part of his church. And we pray that as we come together today, we would sense and know that. We celebrate here what's known as an open communion. And what that means is that if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to come to the table of the Lord. And if you're in a place today where you're not sure who Jesus is, you're not sure whether he is your Lord and Savior, use this as an opportunity to pause and to pray and to say, Lord, I don't know what it is that they're doing, and I don't know if I believe it, but our hope and prayer would be that the next time we celebrate this together, you would say, you know what, I didn't know what they were doing last time, but now I do, and I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And we would invite you to come to the table of the Lord. Friends, as we prepare our hearts together, we're going to prepare in prayer, and then we're going to prepare as we sing a song together. This song, Jesus Paid It All. So would you join me in prayer? Gracious Lord Jesus, we come and we give you thanks that we can gather at this table together today. Lord, that we are invited to come to the table of the Lord. To know, Lord, that there's nothing that we could do to earn it, nothing that we could do to deserve it, but this table represents the free gift of Jesus Christ that 
he has given his life for us. Lord, we know that there's nothing magical that happens here, that this bread or cup becomes anything else, but Lord, we do believe that is on this day when we celebrate Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, that you are present with us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that your Spirit would descend afresh upon this place, afresh upon our hearts and lives, so that, Lord, as we celebrate together, we may be drawn ever closer to you, Jesus. So, Lord, we pray in this moment, would your Spirit fall, fall afresh here. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.